Okay. So one of, um, we have, say, four uh, cycles in our mythology. We have the mythological cycle, which is around the Tuhijadanan. Uh, we have the, the red branch cycle, which is about Kukulun. And we have the Fenian cycle about Finn McCool and Ushin, and we have the King cycle, where you'll hear about Cormac McCart. So the story today is um, from the mythological one. Um, one of the main stories from that is about the, the, the second battle of Moitura, where there's a big battle between the Tuhijadanan and who are the occupiers of Ireland and the evil Favorians. And Balor was their king uh, who held uh, the people of Ireland hostage. And uh, Lou is the, the, the hero in that, and he slays his grandfather uh, and saves Ireland. So what happens in a lot of these stories is that there are various characters that might get some mention, and then they seem to disappear. So there is a character, uh, Birog, who is a druid, and uh, she get, she has an important role to play, but then disappears from the story. So I'm going to tell that story now from her perspective. So bear with me. So you have heard the story of Lou, the great warrior, Lou, law of other, Lou of the long hand, Lou Savaldonok, Lou, the many skilled one, and how he saved Ireland and his people, the Tuhijadanan, from enslavement and terror at the hands of Balor, Nasula Niva, Balor of the evil eye. And in that story, there are two references to a little druid woman called Birog, who now I am that little druid woman. I am Birog. And might I tell you, I am only little on the outside. So I'm going to tell you the real version of the story. I've been on this land a long, long time. And sometimes I'm known as Birog Nishlevta, Birog of the mountains. Well, I lived on the northwest coast of Ireland in Donegal. Balor, he had a stronghold on Tory Island, just off the coast of Donegal. And he was the evilest, ugliest, most horrendous creature ever. And he had one eye in the middle of his forehead. Now, how he got that one eye is a story for another time. But what I can say is that it took 20 warriors with ropes to pull up his eyelid. And all Balor had to do was look and anyone or anything he laid his eye on was instantly burned to a cinder. Balor held the whole island of Ireland to ransom. Every year at an appointed time, he demanded children, women, cattle, horses, mead, crops as a tax from the people. And the Tuijadhanan, for all their magic and all their power and all their skills as warriors, couldn't do anything to save themselves from the evils of Balor. Now, this wasn't helped either by the fact that Brez, the king of the Tuhijadanan, he was half Amorian and half Tuhijadanan. Now, why he was elected, I'll never know. But such is the way with democracy. It was as bad then as it is now. With so-called sensible people electing tyrants or idiots into power. And as I say, Brez was half Tuhijadanan, half Fomorian. On the outside, he was very handsome and very charming. And that was his Tuhije side. Inside, he was evil and vile. That was his Fomorian side. Brez, unfortunately, colluded with Balor and nobody could do anything to stop him. Now, needless to say, I was getting very, very fed up with this situation. It seemed to me that if the people of Ireland were not going to use their skills in magic or their skills as warriors, then I had to do something about the situation. So I became what you would probably call in these times a secret agent. I flew all around Ireland collecting information. So Balor had a wife, Kathleen, she of the crooked teeth, a witch who could easily match Balor in terms of temperament, spirit and soul. They deserved each other. Two of the ugliest, evilest people ever to have walked this land. And one of the great mysteries was that they produced a beautiful little girl 
who had the sweetest of temperaments with beautiful green eyes and long golden hair. I was present on the night she was born and they called her Etna. And it was the custom in ancient times that when the child of a king or a chieftain was born, that a druid was asked to consult the stars and to prophesy a future for this child. Now, there was another druid present on this night who prophesied that Balor's daughter would bear a son and that this son would kill his grandfather. Immediately on hearing this prophecy, the people called for the baby to be killed. Now, this was my chance to act. So I took Balor aside and I persuaded him not to kill his daughter because it would make him appear very weak if it looked like he was afraid of a mere baby. I suggested that he keep him away, keep Ethna away in a tower, away from men or away from conversation by, about men, that he be, that she be taken care of by women. And I said that, well, if she never saw or laid eyes or heard of a man, then the prophecy would be averted. Balor with his one eye, although he fancied himself as a great seer, wasn't as clever or as bright as he thought he was. And he fell for my ruse and agreed with my suggestion. And so it was that Ethna was taken to a tower on Tory Island to be cared for by servant women. And they were given instructions that on pain of death, they were never ever to mention man or to let Ethna see one. And she grew up on a tower in the presence of these women. Now, it must be said that these women loved her dearly and they cared for her as if she were their own. But she spent much of her life alone. There were no other children to play with. Her playmates were the wind and the sea and the sun, the moon and the stars and also the birds. And they used to sing to each other. And Ethna knew every nook, every cranny, every blade of grass on the island. So she was happy and content. Occasionally, her father would visit and it would put the fear of the Dower Coor into her and into all of the women as it hear him thundering across the island. Ethna was petrified of him, for although he was her father, she held no love for him. She was always terrified that he might one day open his eye and look at her and then she would be burned to a cinder. And she would recoil as far away as she could and hide behind the women's skirts for fear of him. And so the years went on and I kept an eye on things on Tory Island from my cave on the mainland. Ethna grew up into be a beautiful young woman. And she told me years later that although she was happy living with the other women on the island, she could sense that there was something missing in her life. There was a deep longing in her heart. A part of her that was missing, but she couldn't name what it was. And she described how she would stand at the rotten parts of the tower, looking out over the sea towards the coastline of Donegal, looking for something, not knowing what it was, but deep down having a sense that she would know as soon as she saw it. In the meantime, there was this handsome looking man called Keen, And he too was having dreams of a beautiful woman with long golden hair and blue green eyes. And he could see her looking out from the tower across the sea. And Cian had such a longing for this woman. And he sensed that she was looking for him. So he came to me in the hope that I might identify this beautiful woman who haunted his dreams. He insisted I tell him who she was because he couldn't live without her. So I told her, told him about Ethna and that Balor was her father. Now, it so happened that Cian had this magic cow that never stopped producing the sweetest of milk. It was called the Gash Gavlin. Balor had tricked Cian and stolen the magic cow. But that is a story for another time. Cian, because of the dreams he was having of Ethna, was less interested in the cow now and he begged me to take him over to Tory because he had to meet her. I agreed on condition that Cian did exactly as I told him. And he was very well aware that this was going to be a very dangerous mission. And he agreed. I dressed him up as a young woman 
and I flew him over to Tory and we landed on the far side of the island from where Ethna was with her women. We threw water over ourselves and walked towards the tower. We knocked on the door and told the woman who answered that our boat had sunk and we needed some shelter for a while. She bade us welcome, but warned us under no circumstances were we to make any reference to man or men. And we agreed. Now, the women had lived in such isolation. They were so glad to have new company. And we spent a wonderful afternoon together, regaling the women with stories of the outside world. And they were so hungry for news. All the time, I could see Keen looking at Ethna. He was mesmerised by her beauty. As she was looking at him shyly, though she saw him as a young woman. Then the time came for me to act. And I took out from beneath my cloak a silver branch and I began to shake it and it made the sweetest of sounds and the women fell into the deepest of sleeps and soon they were snoring. In fact so powerful was the sound of the silver branch that every living creature except myself, Kian and Ethna fell into a deep sleep. The mice, the hares, even the birds, even the sea and the wind were quiet and still. I quickly introduced myself and Kian, who suddenly took off his dress. Ethna stood in wonder there, looking at the goings on. And then as soon as she laid eyes on Kian as he really was, there was that instant recognition. She had found what had been missing in her life. And they looked deeply into each other's eyes and smiled. Well, I felt in the way. So I said I was going for a walk and that I'd be back by dawn. Well, they hardly heard me. So taken up they were with each other. And both Kian and Ethna told me afterwards what happened that night. Kian explained who he was and told Ethna of the prophecy. And this was why she was kept in the tower. It was love at first sight for the two of them. And they embraced. And as you can imagine, they held hands for the rest of the night. So I spent the night walking around the island and as dawn came, I ran back to the tower and said, we have to leave the island at once. Kian insisted that Ethna come too, but I said, I have only strength to carry one of you. Then Kian said he would not leave her. He would stay on the island with Ethna. But both Ethna and I knew this could never be for Balor would surely kill him. Ethna insisted that he leave with me and that the memory of his love and their night together would sustain her. The men, the women were beginning to stir and I knew we were running out of time. So Ethna and kissed for one last time and saying goodbye, I quickly flew Kian away from the island. And as we were flying over towards Donegal, away from the island, we could hear Balor thundering across the island to the tower and the tower shook as Balor barged angrily into the room. I smell a man in here. And of course, the women assured him that there was no, nor had there been any man there. Ethna asked in an innocent voice, what is a man? And luckily for his all seeing eye, he couldn't see her blushes or the spark in her eye. Otherwise, he'd surely have guessed. Well, he huffed and he puffed and then he left. And I flew back every now and again to Tory and I would talk to Ethna and the weeks went by and I began to notice changes in her body. I explained to her what was happening and how the prophecy might be fulfilled. We agreed that we would never tell the women of her pregnancy, for we knew the only thing that would save them from Balor's wrath would be their innocence. Nine months went by and Ethna had managed to keep her pregnancy from the women. And it is interesting to note that when something seems impossible, you cannot see it, even if it's under your very eye. And so when Ethna went into labour, it was with amazement that the women realised what was happening. Fortunately for her, her labour was not too difficult and she gave birth to three beautiful boys. And she loved them as soon as she laid her eyes upon them. And she put them to her breast two at a time. But she knew her existence could not be kept from Balor for very long. And she decided to love them for as long as, and enjoy them for as long as she could. We had arranged that when the time came, I would take her babies and have them cared for. 
which of course was not very long at all. Soon Balor could be heard, thundering his way towards the tower once again. The whole island trembled and the waves crashed frenziedly against the cliff as if in fear of him. He burst through the door in a wild rage, screaming that he had been betrayed. And although his eye was closed, he could somehow sense Ethna's three babies. And he came across the room towards her, grabbed her babies from her. These had been wrapped up in a blanket tied with a pin. And he said he was going to kill them. Ethna followed him, begging him not to kill her babies. But it was no use. He marched towards the rampart and he threw the babies over the cliff. And as the bundle was falling into the sea, the pin opened. One baby dropped out into the sea and then the second baby dropped out and were lost. And I had been flying at that time quickly towards the island and I managed to get the last baby and save him before he fell into the sea. Balor didn't notice this, fortunately, and he left smug in the belief that the prophecy had been averted. I looked up at the parapet and saw Ethna looking down, broken-hearted at the loss of her babies. I nodded to her and flew south towards Donegal again, and Ethna stood on the parapet watching me take her son safely. She called out to me, please take care of my son. His name is Lou, the Shining One. Ethna told me later that she had prayed and prayed that her son would be safe and would grow up to be big and strong and that he would fulfill the prophecy about his grandfather. This, this gave her a reason to live. With the love she had shared with Kean on that one night and the love she had for her son Lou, she had the strength to withstand the loneliness of living on the island without her man or without her children. And she told me that later that she was aware that this loneliness was the price that she had paid for love and for knowing love. And she said she was pleased to say that it was worth it. Having left Tory Island, I flew to my cave in Donegal to rest for a while before taking the infant Lou to Talshu to be fostered by her. Ethna and I had agreed we would keep Lou's existence a secret from the women, but also from Kian and Lou, for we knew that if Kian knew, he would go in search of Lou. And then Balor would find out and then they would both be in danger. And again, over the years, I would fly over to Ethna and fill her in on how Lou was doing, how he grew up to be a fine and honorable young man, how he was skilled at so many things. And I really enjoyed telling her how he had gained entrance into Tara and how he gained the name Lou, the many skilled one, Lou Savaldonok. Oh, she was so proud of him. And it was a very sad day when I had to tell her of the death of Kian. She was heartbroken. She had secretly hoped that one day the prophecy would be fulfilled and that she and Kian would be together once more. But alas, that was never to be. Years passed and I and the Tuhijadana were getting tired of having to pay tributes to Balor. And I encouraged them to fight back with Lou as their leader. And so a great battle, known as the Second Battle of the Loitura in Sud, between the Tuhijadan and the Favorians. In this battle, slew, Lou slew his grandfather using a, shli, a, sling, a slingshot, which pushed the eye out of his head, and it landed in front of his own men, who were instantly slain. The Fomorians were defeated, and quickly they left the island of Ireland. The prophecy had been fulfilled. There was peace at last on the land. After the battle, I went up to Lou and I told him his, of his real identity and of the prophecy. And when he heard this, he wanted to meet his mother. So quickly, I took him to Tori. She recognized him immediately. Ah, oh, he was so like his father. And their reunion was so joyous. And despite the years apart, it had felt as if they'd always known each other. And of course, at some level they had. Lou took his mother and her women to live with him in Tara, where they lived happily until the time came when they had to pass through the Vale to make room for the new people, the Sons of Mill. 
Remember Lou's two brothers who had fallen into the sea before I could save them? Well, they didn't perish. They were taken care of by the seal people. They are our Selkies, and they can be seen today swimming around the island of Tory, and sometimes they even come ashore. My story is at an end now, but before I go, remember, it was the women in this story that the Thuhijidanan were able to free themselves from the torment of the Fomorians. Shine. Oh, thank you very much indeed for that, Ema. Um, I think we should unmute ourselves for a moment and yeah. have... Uh... I think that's an excellent idea. Thank you, Ema. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Wonderful telling. Wonderful. So there are some great questions in the chat as well, aren't there? Brilliant. Are you going to read them? We don't have questions or comments in the chat uh, yet. No. Nope. So. Um, oh, sorry, no, we don't. Oh. <laughs> Wishful thinking, Julie. Yes. Oh. But I, I guess love, the story I love was. The little bits of humor, the um, little bits of humor when you said about uh, the, one, the one with one eye yes. who thought he was a bit of a seer. <laughs> <laughs> That was kind of um, delusions of grandeur <laughs> kind of thing. It was interesting. Yes. yes. It was a very nice play on words. <laughs> yes. <laughs> very good. Thank you. I'll ask a question, actually, uh, yeah. Ema. Sure. Um, you said about the, the silke. Are they related to the fae in Irish tradition? They... They're separate. They're the, well, I suppose they are in some way. They're the seal people. I mean, you have that tradition in Scotland as well as Ireland. Yes. And yeah. you've got many of the stories where you have um, the Selkie women dancing by moonlight and a fisherman uh, falls yes. in love with them and takes one woman's skin and keeps it. So yes. uh, that's a very strong one. That's also here in Ireland. And in Tory Island, particularly, they believe that the seals there are the brothers of Lou. Right. Okay. So that's an ongoing belief to this yeah. day then. Oh, brilliant. brilliant. And I, I was there last summer. Uh, a, a colleague of mine, um, another Druid, Sean O'Guihin, he's a member of the order, we held a retreat in Donegal recently about the Beer Oak story um, in the landscape. So we went to Tory, but I was there last year with him and there were seals there and just watching them with their beautiful brown eyes just one was on the on a pier on a, a slipway and then just f s s swimming around you just clap your hands and they just came it just very close to the surface these magic eyes it was just pure magic and then i'd heard that yes these are um uh lou's brothers just a beautiful a beautiful story we've got a question uh, in our chat by martin Hi, wonderful telling. Thank you so much. Can you comment on the role of the daughter mother imprisonment in a tower? This seems to be a recurring element in myth and folklore. Yes, it is. And I suppose uh, when this is normally stories, like Biro gets two mentions and then she's gone. She's of no relevance at all. And when you think, as is the mother Ethna, and so often in stories, you know, women just give birth and that's it, goodbye. But actually, they are crucial to the whole story. You know, um, it's in many ones, but that, that it's undermined. And I suppose I try to uh, give give some kind of uh, develop the character of Ethan a little bit. Sometimes I tell the story from Ethan's perspective. This time it's from Birog, but that she actually is the one who ensures that the prophecy is fulfilled, ensures Lou's conception by bringing Keen over to Ethna and saving Ethna's life as a baby uh, to say, okay, this is one way of keeping her safe and maintaining it, otherwise she could have been killed. And it's not the first time that a prophecy has been made by about a female baby causing problems where there's a wish to kill her. Uh, there's another one with, um, 
Conor Magnessa when um, Deirdre of the Sorrows is born, it's prophecy that she will be very, very beautiful and that she will cause bloodshed. Again, blaming women and beautiful women for causing all sorts of things. And there is a call from the Red Branch Knights, the Ulster Warriors, to kill the baby. And Conor Magnessa says no. He gives the impression. Hours. Sorry. Oh. Sorry. No, it's my computer. Sorry. Okay. He, he he gives the impression. No, no. We'll I'll save the baby, and we'll have the baby cared for. But he decides he's going to marry her. He's an old man by the time she grows up, and she falls in love with another young man, and they have to flee, and he kills them. But again, it's that. Um, either women of no consequences or are dangerous and uh, uh, are, are causes of battles. And, and and so it's around, I suppose, looking for the power of women in these stories. And Birog uh, is a very, very powerful character. Thank you for that. We've got another question um, by Emily. Um, do you have any pictures of uh, uh, the folk represented in the story? Of the people? No, actually, I don't. You mean of the, of the characters? Uh, I th yes, I think yeah. this is what Emily is referring yeah. to. Yes. I don't actually know. Oh. I, I'm I, not an illustrator. I think it's, it's, it's yes, um, I don't know. I guess it leaves more space to imagination and uh, each one's personal um, creativity in this case. Um, there is, there, a... there is there is somebody who does illustrate Sean Fitzgerald. Um, gee, I'm, somebody's nodding. Is that Lisa? Yeah, he's an illustrator and he's from Donegal. And uh, so Sean, my friend, has written a book or he tells the story, Lou, uh, and in the and it's uh, in Irish by Carlo Sharkey, who's an Irish poet, Irish language poet. And then Sean does the illust illustration. So sean fitzgerald if you google him you will find i see martin says uh okay for art uh okay so martin is going to send a link uh he's he's a beautiful uh, illustrator is is sean so uh yeah you've got his name there so if you google him you'll find him well, that's fantastic we were we have as well another question who were the fomorians the Fomorians were these ugly beings, the baddies, uh, who came from the north. And I don't, uh, whether they, you see, when, I don't know when the, the Laurago War, when these stories were written. Obviously, uh, the mythological um, cycle features way, way, way long before the Celts came, going way, way back. But they weren't written until, written by the monks. Uh, uh, whether they were people from the north, maybe conflated with um, with the Vikings, I don't know. But they were the baddies who were ugly, deformed, evil. Where the Tuatha were beautiful, magical, etc. Now, obviously, highly flawed as well. So Balor, they were pirates. So they demanded tribute every year from from the people of Ireland. But there was intermarriage. So like Lou was half from Warian. So Ethna was from Warian, but she was she was beautiful. Um, so he was half and half. Um, Brez was half and half. So it wasn't that they didn't um, intermarry. It was just Balor was particularly evil. Um, Thank, Thank you, you very much. Well. I also you know. have a question. Oh, sorry, Emily. I was just going to say, I think you make it the nail on the head there with the, the linkage possibly in the past with the Vikings, because that was a known pattern of behaviour with them as well. So, Yes. Um, I also have a question. Um, I am completely ignorant about Druidry today, but, uh, and Druidism, but um, I'm quite interested in how much do you think um, uh, storytelling is a, a vital part of of the the religious tradition now that we all live on how much uh, what what sort of space occupies in in the practice and in the training of a of a contemporary druid storytelling is very important so um within um the order of bards ovids and druids we have three levels it's not hierarchical but there's a pathway 
you follow. And the first one is the Bardic one. So, and central to Irish culture in the past and in, 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 in Britain and Gaul, where we had primarily Druids, telling stories is very, very important. And I think, I don't think there's any tradition where there isn't a storytelling, any culture where there isn't a storytelling tradition. So the bards are very, very important as stories for, as parables or uh, disseminating news or uh, reminding us of the past. I think it's crucial. Um, and even this is an old story, but you know, I say that people elect idiots into power who are abusive. And I mean, we have Valor characters in power in the 21st century, I'm sure maybe you could think of one or two. <laughs> uh, and how powerless we are to manage them. And when you look at the destruction, how they're either, uh, you know, demanding ta tax crops, destroying the landscape or whatever it is, people's power, it's still there. It's an old theme. And maybe we need a few more beer oaks to uh, do something about this. Uh, okay, in that stage, it's 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 um, getting a sniper to <laughs> with a slingshot <laughs> to do it. But uh, somehow, how we elect people into power and hand over our own power and not reclaim it. And I suppose that, you know, in the story is that even the Thuajadanan for so long, with all their magical powers, somehow weren't able to do something, do anything about it. And often we get into a place of helplessness around, well, what can we do mm -hmm. about the state of the world? And maybe there's something around, get the beer in all of us just to kind of wake up and say, maybe I can do something. Maybe I can make a change, even though I'm small, or even to think about it. Thank you very much for this answer. It's exactly what I was uh, uh, interested in. Uh, we've got a comment from Martin. I've heard that the Fomorians may have been derived from old Irish words that either mean underground phantoms for more or sea monsters, an old use of more. They yes. seem similar to the Nordic uh, Jodna, Celtic beings that oppose the Norse gods. They could well be, because more is another word for, for the sea, and uh, fui, war, would be under the sea. So fui is the one word for uh, under. So it could absolutely be, yes. I, I, I didn't, obviously, I don't, work, I don't uh, speak Old Irish, but more, it's the Indo-European root for, for, for sea. In fact, in Italian, we still call it mare. Yeah. And it's interesting because it's Indo-European and it means a big lake because the, the, the people from that part of the world didn't really know the sea. So they thought it was a big lake. This is okay. a, a very interesting link that you just uh, brought up. Uh, thank you, Emir, and thank you, Martin. We've got another comment from, uh, another question from Sharon. Are there more stories about taking birth omens from the stars? Is there more in contemporary Druidism about this practice? Okay, I'm just, I've got to read the question because just, I'm not sure I understand it. Okay, um, is it there on the chat? Sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah Sharon Rowe. Taking birth omens from the stars, is there more in contemporary Druidism about this practice? Well, there are the stories, like I just mentioned, the one, um about from Cormac the stories of the sons of Usna, where um it's prophesied that Deirdre is going to uh cause a lot of problems. That's one big, big story. Um and um the, the, in any of the stories there was a tradition, you know, where the king would look like I say in the story, or a chieftain that the would have uh, a druid would be asked to, to divine the, the child's future. That would have been very, very important. Um, whether that's big, we don't teach that particularly in druidry because I'm not a diviner, but people have, there's lots of divination tools that we use within druidry. There's Ohm and there's you know, tarot. We have animal oracles that Philip and Stephanie Cargom have developed, plant oracle, the druid graph tarot. There's other members who have created their own uh, divination systems that are really, really useful. Um, and then there's astrology as well. It's not my forte, but it is for many druids. So uh, druidry is so broad that you can't, well, I can't anyway, 
have an expertise in all of it because it's storytelling, it's herbalism, it's star lore, it's divination, it's writing, it's it's a, and healing, it's teaching, celebrancy. It's very very broad. So we, I suppose, choose our own areas of 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 interest. But divination is 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 an important part of druidry for those who have the skill to do it and and the interest. I missed a question before from Emily. Uh, I apologize, Emily. Uh, Ima, is there a tune on the harp to accompany your talk? No. <laughs> Not that. I think everyone here was Sorry, thinking I about that. It's, I, I was away for I haven't I, I haven't played this it's 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 out of tune so sorry about that had I thought about it I might have but unfortunately no I'm too vain to to play badly so fair enough uh, Ma <laughs> Emily says next time um, Martin um, a comment from Martin at the risk of talking too much <laughs> one more comment uh, <laughs> never never enough Martin I'll be uh, uh, sorry for art. I was thinking about the artist Jim Fitzgerald, so not Sean, I, I guess. He Jim wrote, he says he wrote and beautifully illustrated a few books on Irish uh, mythology, including the Book of Conquests. Highly recommended and beautifully illustrated. So we've yeah. got a second artist. It's Jim Fitzpatrick, not Jim Fitzgerald. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So uh, I, uh, yeah, he's very colorful. Uh, uh, and there's another guy, Courtney Davis, who is based in Tara. He's 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 English, living in Tara. He yeah. does his his uh, illustrations. Mm -hmm. I love um, my bias is Sean Fitzgerald, and his is in uh, it's, it's it's monochrome. Uh, I see, Lisa, you're nodding. Uh, uh, yeah, I I like his style. It's 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 <clears throat> he's been described as another Jim Fitzpatrick, so. They're all very well, you know, worth looking at. Okay. Somebody's going to oh, play music at the end. That's good. I don't know who that is. Julie. <laughs> Lovely, Julie. <laughs> well, we've just got to decide when the end is first, because it's only just one whiz on the chimes. <laughs> <laughs> Magical. <laughs> or we could go that way. <laughs> so, um. so we could have also a little bit of music to accompany yeah, the storytelling. Well. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't see any more questions on our chat. No, no. me neither. Well, that was wonderful. Um, it's recording. I'll stop the recording now then if we haven't got any more questions to save space. Yes, no one yes. else? Yeah.